All right, some of the folks from all over the country. Wonderful. All right. Well, I think we have a large number of folks on. So why don't we we kick it off and folks can continue to to trickle in. Um, and so Aaron, if you want to want to get us started. Absolutely. Sounds great. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we have Joanne Peterson joining us from Learn to Cope. And just a few housekeeping items as everybody is trickling in. Everybody is currently on listen only mode, but we do have the chat enabled now as well as the Q&A box. So if you would feel free to populate your questions that you might have for Joanne uh, in the Q&A and in the chat throughout the webinar, and we will save all of those up and respond to those toward the end. Today's session is brought to you by the Substance Use Interest Group. We currently have seven different interest groups at National Council, and we invite you to explore all of those different topics. Uh, being a part of our interest groups is a free member benefit, and you can explore any of the interest groups and feel free to join those. If you have any questions, you can feel free to shoot us a message, uh, shoot me a message. I will drop my email address down in the chat as well. Uh, if you have any issues or any 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 trouble uh, signing up for the interest groups, you can feel free to contact me. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our substance use staff lead and my colleague Alexander Plant. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erin, and thank you everybody for joining us today. I am beyond, um, well, I'm Alexandra Plant, if uh, we haven't had the pleasure of meeting before. Um, and as Erin said, I lead the Substance Use Interest Group at the National Council. We try and run regular webinars or put out sort of thought leadership type blogs whenever we can um, and choose topics that are meaningful to you all and are topics that you're interested in hearing about. So um, I actually know Joanne from when I worked back at the Recovery Research Institute. She was on the board of advisors there. And so I had the, the pleasure of getting to know her and we saw each other recently at the 10 year anniversary um, celebration. And I said, you have to come and speak to us sort of the the intersection of substance use disorder treatment and recovery services and how how all of this affects families and how families are incorporated into this and you know all of these things are just um i mean it's interesting and it's sticky and it's it's wonderful and it's everything but it's also something that we can do better and so just mm -hmm. so excited to have um joanne here today so Joanne is the founder and executive director of Learn to Cope, a nonprofit peer-led support network founded in 2004 and funded by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Um, Joanne's journey started as a young girl with siblings experiencing issues with mental health and addiction. And after years of watching family members struggle with opioid addiction, you know, Joanne was motivated and empowered to use her voice to bring about change. She designed Learn to Cope to offer families a support, education, resources, and hope that her family would have benefited from. Mm -hmm. So Learn to Cope has grown a ton um, in the past years, which is an ode to Joanne. Um, they have a full staff who collaborates with communities across the state of Massachusetts, spreading messages of prevention, education, awareness, advocacy. Um, while there are in-person chapters throughout Massachusetts, um, there are also a growing number of virtual chapters that operate throughout and, well, online throughout the United States. Um, the Learn to Cope website also provides a private online forum that supports over 12,000 members. Learn to Cope families receive unique support and education from professionals 
and peers. So they get that, that dual, dual support. Um, Joanne has collaborated with the Massachusetts Department of Public Health to become the first parent network in the United States to provide overdose reversal antidote, um, the nasal naloxone. And so today facilitators are trained and certified to provide overdose education and kits across the state. Um, and this has led to successful reversals of over 200 opioid overdoses since 2011. So Learn to Cope opened its first family recovery center in East Hampton, Massachusetts in January of 2022. And very exciting, we'll open its second center on Cape Cod in the fall of this year. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, I would love to pass the torch over to Joanne, but we are so excited to have you and welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank you and the National Council for inviting me to speak. It's, it's a real honor. And um, I thought maybe before I go through my talking points, maybe we could show a video that we had done and it really highlights exactly what Learn to Cope is and, and what our families receive from that. So if we could play that video first, I think that would be wonderful. Thank you so much everyone for coming. <laughs> I'm just trying to get the video to the the video screen to pop up for me. <laughs> there we go. Okay. I think the audio is unfortunately not. That's what I'm trying to through. Yeah. I'm sure everyone out there relates to is not the, <laughs> it is not a walk in the park. <laughs> okay. The world of Zoom. <laughs> it might be. I wonder if I need to disconnect my earbuds. Let me try that. Learn to go came after an experience in our home with my son and his involvement with substance use. Well, I have a loved one that struggled with addiction. We've been struggling with our daughter uh, for a number of years. She started to get involved with drugs and alcohol that led to an you know, opioid uh, use disorder. Our oldest daughter, Katie, was suffering from a very acute substance use disorder. Our son was struggling and we didn't know anything about the disease of addiction. And we were, uh, frankly, we were panicking. You just are at a loss, a loss of what to do. We were at a loss of what to do. Learn to Cope is a family support network. What we offer is a sense of hope, but also we offer resources, we offer education, we offer Narcan training. Let's just say like pre-Learn to Cope, it was kind of like a horrific problem. What did I do wrong? You need to stop it, I need to fix it. You know what it has gone it has gone silent and is skipping forward so what i'm going to do because it is a very compelling video is i'm just going to drop um the the link to it in the chat so if you visit the learn to cope homepage, it's just the the video is just a minute or two but it really it's a beautiful video i know you guys mm -hmm. must have worked hard on it. so <laughs> We'll, <laughs> we'll cut, cut our losses on this, but it, I encourage everybody to, to check it out. Thank and so, you. yeah, Joanne, if you want to share a screen on the PowerPoint, mm -hmm. I apologize on our end. That's Not a problem. So hello, everybody. If you um, can't get the video on that link, you can always go to our website, which is learn with the numeral two cope.org, and you can watch that video right on our homepage. And I'm going to share my screen and um, start my presentation. So, Thank you so much for having me. It's really nice to see so many people coming out to 
hear from a family member, I feel that, um, you know, a lot of times we talk so much about all the different modalities of um, substance use disorder and treatment options and, and, you know, deaths and incarceration, but we don't always talk about the families left behind. And that's the siblings, the parents, the children of, um, and the partners of somebody that, that they love um, that's experiencing substance use disorder. So Learn to Cope started in 2004, which is almost 20 years ago, which I, I can't believe it's been 20 years. Um, and I figured I would just run through the reasons why Learn to Cope started, as, as was mentioned earlier. I started Learn to Cope by accident in 2004 when my son was just graduating high school and he had tried OxyContin um, with his friends and became addicted to that. And my family went through so much just trying to learn the continuum of care. I didn't even know what the continuum of care was. I didn't know how to find a detox or treatment center. I didn't know that the first detox wouldn't be the last. Um, today, he's in long-term recovery, and I'll get back into that piece of it later. But over the years after I started Learn to Cope, I realized it really started in the 70s when I was a little girl. Because once I got out there and started talking with other families that were experiencing what I experienced, I started to think back to my older sister um, who, you know, experiences mental illness with schizophrenia, and then my brother with cocaine and alcohol addiction. And he spent many years incarcerated on and off. He would get in trouble in school. Um, my mom would try to to help him with, you know, just getting out of bed every morning. And that's him up on the right-hand corner. He passed away in 2011. But when I was a young girl, he was my hero. He, he was a beautiful soul, a very nice person, but he had a terrible issue. And back in those days, no one talked about addiction. They didn't use the word mental illness. They used to just say somebody was crazy or they were a bad person because they'd be in trouble all the time. They didn't talk about why they were in trouble all the time. And what was happening with him, when I look back at his life now, is he just needed help with alcohol addiction and depression. And then on the left-hand side, you see this picture of me when I was younger with my niece, my beautiful niece, Janine. I just lost her, it'll be five years this July to a fentanyl overdose. Um, unfortunately, she also became addicted using opiates within our family. Um, so this still hits my family today. And I believe in support, education, resources, and hope. Because when this happens to your child or someone in your family, a lot of times, as a family member, you internalize it. You try to figure out why it's happening. You don't always have the understanding of substance use disorder. Um, we only just started calling it a disorder just a few years ago. It was finally declared as a medical issue where I know many of you were in this work have heard that, you know, diabetes, if someone isn't taking their insulin or, or eating a proper diet or exercising and they're really overweight and they have diabetes, when they go to the doctor, they don't get told, well, you're not following your diet, so we can't take you back again this time. It's com the complete opposite with, with substance use disorder. There's a, a stigma involved and it's attached. So to the right, you see, I do a lot of advocacy. That's um, with Senator Markey at the White House. Um, I was honored to be able to go to the State of the Union address back when Obama was president. And here in Massachusetts, we're, we're pretty lucky. Um, we do a lot in our state when it comes to substance use disorder and, and treatment and prevention and harm reduction as well. So as I said, we are now today, 20 years later after starting Learn to Cope, going through this with my son, I designed the meetings um, because I wanted that support, education, resources, and hope. Because back in the 70s, as I said, no one spoke about this. Um, my mom didn't want to ask for help because of stigma and then judgment. She didn't want people to blame her. She didn't know what to do. 
So when my brother would be incarcerated, he would get out and, and she'd try to find somewhere for him to go. And, and then, you know, or he would come home and he would relapse and end up back in jail again. And, you know, I would go and visit her, visit him with her when I was a young child. And the trauma of that can stick with somebody um, when they're young. And my mother was the most wonderful mother in, in the world. I loved her dearly. But what she didn't realize as well is it might not have been a good idea for me to be going to visit him in jail every Sunday. But then again, what else was she going to do? Um, she had a, a, a young girl. She didn't want to leave home alone, but she also needed to see her son. So my bottom line with this is my mother really needed some help. And back in those days, there really wasn't any. So today, when we have our meetings, I always want to have professionals come there to teach us about substance use disorder, to teach us about the continuum of care, to teach us overdose prevention and how we can save the lives of people. And that's where the naloxone distribution comes in because back in 2011 and before then, we would have parents coming to our meetings that had found their son or daughter um, overdose. They'd have to rescue breathe on their own if they knew how, or sadly, sometimes it would be too late. And I had heard about nasal naloxone um, that they were using in the streets of Boston with harm reduction workers. And I, I, again, myself and other parents from Learn to Cope advocated for this and said, we're first responders too. A lot of times we're the first responders. They might be living at home. We find them in their bedrooms or in the bathroom with the door locked and we have to kick the door in because we we know that you know they, they've been using and we hear a thud. So we were very lucky in Massachusetts where they, they allowed Learn to Cope to become a pilot. And we had such a large reach to so many parents around the state, it made a lot of sense. And of course we collected data like any other pilot and confidential paperwork where when, whenever we trained for naloxone and gave out a kit of naloxone, you know, we would collect that data, zip codes, you know, age of the person. Um, and then also we would have to get a report back if they used it. We would ask people to please report this back to us so that we can report to the Department of Public Health that there was another life saved, which was great because it was that data showed the need and that Narcan worked and that it was saving lives. Um, so we have in-person and Zoom meetings um, representing members throughout Massachusetts and beyond. We have a meeting that meets twice a month that starts at 9 p.m. Eastern time so that we can serve the West Coast. And it's basically the same as what we do here. We're, we're just there to support each other, not to judge, not to tell people what to do and, and never ever judge the treatment pathway that their family member takes because our belief is there's multiple pathways to treatment and no one should ever judge what someone's pathway is. Just trying to get to my next slide. Um, so we also on our website, which is learn with the number two cope.org, um, People can fill out a stay connected form, which it just collects your email address if you want to join a meeting. Um, so since then, we added that and the Zoom groups. We also have a Learn to Cope creative writing group that meets on Saturdays, which has been a very healing tool for people. Um, it, it started as sort of a, an experiment just to, to keep people engaged during the COVID shutdown. And, and it turned into this absolutely beautiful healing group that we have to do in increments now because so many people want to join it. And um, Caleb Daniloff, who runs our writing group, just published an article in Runner's World magazine. And since that article went out there, I cannot believe how many people um, are contacting us yet again to join our Zoom meetings. It just shows the need. Um, we have webinars as well um, with, you know, guests to educate on addiction, educate on harm reduction, educate on, on family and coping skills. Um, we have a group called Still Learning, Still Coping, which is a unique grief group. Um, during COVID, we started noticing, you know, reaching more rural areas as well as other communities that we weren't able to serve before. 
And what we started to notice was there were many people that had lost one person or one child, but still had another person or another child or young adult that was actively using. So they didn't know where they, they belonged. They didn't want to go to a grief group and talk about their what they needed for their loved one that was still living. And they didn't want to go to a regular support group and talk about the grief of the loss that they were experiencing, the loss of their child or spouse. So they, they just felt lost, like they needed somewhere to go. And they didn't feel like they fit in either one. They needed a separate, unique group, which we started. And that uh, Peter Babineau, who is the director of our East Hampton Family Center started it, and it's a very loving group. Uh, it's a unique group, and now they have a place to go where they can feel supported by people that are going through the same exact situation. We're starting another one called Learn to Cope Remembers. Um, unfortunately, there's quite a need for grief groups out there, and when somebody loses someone to an overdose, when you're a family member, and you go to a regular grief group where you might be in a room where people have died from, you know, car accidents or from cancer or some other disease. It's hard for people to raise their hand and say that their their loved one died of an overdose. They just feel different. They feel stigmatized. And it it's not so much that people are are, you know, saying anything to them, but at the same time, it's just different. Um, they feel different and they needed their own space, their own safe space to share. We also, through COVID, we started a wellness series where, um, again, to keep people engaged, keep, keep people connected, because we were very worried about the isolation that was going on. Even, you know, obviously people, treatment centers weren't able to have as many people there with social distancing. So there was a, a lot more worry out there, a lot less treatment because of COVID-19. So we felt like we needed more self-care than ever before. So we started the wellness series where we'd have um, yoga, sound healing, um, nighttime yoga if someone was having a hard time sleeping. And, and the special thing about it is we found people in recovery that were practicing um, these mindfulness and, and healing scenarios so it was even more special for us to see that that's somebody in recovery that's actually giving back and, and living a good life and and actually helping us to to cope with what we're going through i'm also very proud to say that we have learned to cope in espanol in spanish and magda collin who you'll see on that video um hopefully you'll watch the video it's very special um she's on on that video talking about you know how it's very important, as we know, when you walk into a room, you want to see people that look like you or also speak your language. And there was a real um, need for that for a very long time. And I'm so fortunate to have Magda, who works with Learn to Cope, and um, she's working on starting our second Learn to Cope in Spanish. It is on Zoom, which is great. Um, and what I heard recently was there are people actually joining that group from other countries because people are getting in touch with family members, as an example, in Colombia, and saying, there's this meeting you can get on if you need some help. So I just think that's extremely special. And then also, I mentioned we have the Learn to Cope National Group, um, which has been meeting a little over a year. And we do that at a different time, Eastern time, so that people on the West Coast and in the mid Midwest can join and get support, peer support. So we've also had um, for many years, um, there's always been this issue with, you know, grandparents raising grandchildren. And what's unique and, and hard about this situation and not what people always think about is you might be a, a grandparent, but you might still have a, a young adult in college or in high school. Um, and then you might also be taking care of elderly parents. So when you're faced with this, and, and this is what we see a lot, um, it's it's a real hardship because not only are they still taking care of you know younger children that might still be in high school or early college age, 
They might be taking care of elderly parents and now they have an infant. And then on top of that, they're worrying about their son or daughter who can't take care of their child. Um, it's It causes a lot of um, financial burden, financial worries. Um, it can cause problems in a marriage if two people are, are at retire, retirement age on a fixed income and you know, one one parent might say, one grandparent might say, we have to do this. And the other one might say, I don't know if I can do this again. Um, there could be health issues going on. So it's really hard for the family. So there's so much support needed for grand families or foster care families um, to help care for these children. And because we've been around for 20 years, I can tell you this. I know people that are now in college that when we started, their grandparents were raising them. And I've seen some very good outcomes, but I've also seen some that have not worked out very well. And a lot of times it's because there's you know, not a lot of support for these kids out there that are orphaned. They don't always have grandparents to, to take care of them. Sometimes they end up in foster care. So some of the things that we like to do with our nonprofit part piece of Learn to Cope is support those kids that you know are, involved in the Department of Children Family Services or being raised by a grandparent on a very fixed income or in foster care. So we try to do as much as we can for the kids and for those grand families. And this is just a picture um, with, with permission from um, a few summers back. We do this every year, although with two, for two years we could not because of COVID. Um, and we have a day for these children to just have a fun day and not worry about what they're going through and have the grandparents be, or the, the caregivers be with other caregivers. And what struck me one summer was, you know, all these buses pulling up and you see all these summer camp kids coming off the bus and, and you know, in large droves going up to the amusement park. And then we had two buses full of, of families and, you know, just like a, they look like every other family, but what people didn't realize is almost all of those kids coming off those buses either lost a parent, had a parent out there struggling, or might have a parent in recovery. Um, it just shows that, you know, they just, they're like everybody else, but they don't get the same services that everybody else does. And this is Magda and Nellie. Um, and I, I mentioned about our Spanish group. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Um, you know, just being culturally respectful, um, having a place where people speak that language, their own language um, that look like them has been very important. And I just am so proud that we're able to do this. And I'm so grateful to have Magda and Nelly do this for us because it's, it's extremely important and extremely special. This is just some stats that I we threw together just to show, um, you know, what the meeting attendance is like. And this is, you know, 2022. So we had 11,081 people attending all of our Zoom meetings online between Zoom and in person. We always collect, we don't collect names and addresses, but we collect, you know, how many people are at this meeting um, just to, to give data on how the need, to show the need. And then we had 584 meetings and 113 guest speakers on our website. Um, Alexandra had mentioned our discussion board, which is a private discussion board. Everything is free. Everything is confidential. No one ever has to take out an insurance card or pay for anything. They just get on our website. And we do have a registration for our discussion board. And that's only to keep it a safe space. So when someone registers, we say, how did you hear about us? And, you know, what can we do for you? And as long as it's a family member that needs help, then they'll be um, allowed to register for that. And people can communicate there seven days a week. So it's kind of nice. It could be a Sunday. Someone might be going through a lot and just need a little bit of extra help. Um, they might be able to just get on there and say, does anyone have the phone number for this certain um, detox or my son, you know, relapsed yesterday. I just need someone to talk to. So it's just people talking back and forth and communicating all the time so that we are never have to be alone. Um, we had 373 out-of-state registrations in the year 2022. 
and new registrations were 1,003, and there's over 12,000 people on that. And it's not like social media, you're not putting yourself out there for the world to read what you're going through. It's very private and a very safe space. Um, our stay connected information requests is when someone's on our website and they click on stay connected. Um, we had 912 new people from around the country. Um, the forum, which is what I just talked about, we had 466 new members on that and 526 people attended our wellness, which was the, what I spoke about earlier, the online sound healing, bedtime yoga or gentle yoga. And we record those. So if people can't do that live on a Friday night and they need to do it on a Saturday night, they can just, um, once they register for wellness, again, it's free, but once they register for it, they can you know, just play that link on a Saturday night if they're having a hard time falling to sleep and their mind is going and, and they need to settle down, they can just watch that or listen to that. Um, so the activity for the forum is, New topics. A topic on the forum is somebody might say, I need Narcan. Does anyone know where I can get it today? That's a new topic. So there were 225 new topics. Um, there were 761 new posts. And that's usually people, you know, just posting on a certain topic. And then the membership today is 12,538. So again, we, you know, I found in Marta Cope in 2004 and my son had gotten into some trouble. I never would have done this except for he had gotten into some trouble and it ended up in the newspaper and it involved his, his addiction. And usually that goes hand in hand. And so the cat was out of the bag, my husband and I, and my two other children, it just became news in our town. And that's where the stigma began. And I guess what happened to me during that time was my own trauma from my childhood just came right back. It was, I was right back in the seventies again with my brother getting in trouble and people just, you know, thinking he was just this awful person or my sister with her mental illness. Um, today she's in a nursing home. She has um, paranoid schizophrenia. So back in those days, we didn't know what that was. We just thought she drank too much. And she was medicating herself because of her mental illness. And we, we didn't know this. So fast forward to 2004, my husband and I for three years had struggled trying to get my son the help that he needed. I had gone to a meeting and I raised my hand and I said, my son's now using heroin, I need help. And I was told this meeting is not about your son. It's about you. We can't really talk about him. You just need to learn how to take care of yourself. And there's nothing you can do about his addiction. He's just going to have to hit rock bottom and there's nothing you can do. I said, no, I'm not going back to that. I need to know what I can do to help him. There's got to be something. He's, he was only 19. And, um, that's when I walked out and he ended up, he was incarcerated and I went to visit him in jail and he was starting to feel his feelings again. Um, he was a baby. And I said to him, do you want to be remembered for what's being written in the newspapers? And it was basically a petty crime. And, you know, the dr words drug addict were used. And I said, or do you want to tell people what happened to you? And what it was is he had gone to a, a local parent's house that was doling out alcohol to the kids in town and also prescription Oxycontin and he was allowing them to crush and snort. And um, we did that to get our dignity back. We were already being talked about and written about and it, it was about everything but the story behind the story. And that's the only reason we came out was to get our dignity back. And I had no idea the amount of people that I would hear from. And back in those days, we didn't have the internet like we do today. We didn't even have cell phones. Um, and we had dial up internet. So if I was to use email, no one could be on the phone. <laughs> and I became like this dear Abby, just constantly trying to answer all these emails after the newspaper article went out. Um, the reporter had put my email address there, which back then was learn to cope 2001 at Yahoo. And that's what I was doing. I was learning how to cope. 
And like I said, I mentioned the trauma from my childhood. I never really realized the trauma that I still carried with me until this happened. And it was like going right back to those days. And um, it brought it out. And I think as awful as it is that we had to go through this, my husband and I and my younger kids and my son, who's now in, I, he has like 15 years in recovery now. Um, it took that for me to find healing for that childhood trauma, as well as the trauma that our family was experiencing with this. And now I have an unbelievable um, tribe of people within Learn to Cope because I'm still one of those people too. And I think that's what's very special about peer support groups is because you're with your people. Um, so anyway, in 2011, uh, we had talked about naloxone and how we became um, a first parent pilot group to offer that. And we've had over 200 saves because I, as I mentioned earlier, we do collect that data for the Department of Public Health. Narcan is so much more available today around the country, still needs work, uh, should be even more available, but now you can get it at pharmacies in some states, I think in most states. Um, and we still provide it at all of our meetings. During COVID, we had to get very crafty <laughs> and do the trainings online over Zoom. And then we, we, we would go to people's houses and drop it off um, or put it in their mailbox so that we could be socially distanced. So that was really important for us to just keep that Narcan available because um, everyone should have it that has somebody um, living with substance use disorder. Not only that, if elderly people that live alone, sometimes they have pain management and they might also have anxiety drugs like benzodiazepines. So Narcan should be available also for people that take care of elderly people. If they get forgetful and they take their medicine twice and they're mixing opioid pain relievers with benzos, or sometimes they might have a drink. And some of these assisted living homes, they have a cocktail hour. And that always astounded me when my dad was in assisted living because a lot of times they're on medication and then they go downstairs and, and they have a little cocktail hour and, you know, they have like a, a little glass of wine, but it's just astounding to me that the there's so much more education that needs to go out there on all levels, not just someone that has people living at home um, that have substance use disorder. Um, I talked about our Still Learning, Still Coping group in 2020 that started. That's going well. I talked about our Spanish group. Um, we collaborated with another coalition, which we love to collaborate with other coalitions and groups that help people out there. That's what it's all about, working together. Anything that we can do to help people is a good thing. So there is a, another organization called the Safe Coalition, and we worked with them to get a sibling group going because many times the siblings, again, that they're, they're left behind, they're a little different from the parents. They don't seem to want to be at a group every week, but it's nice for them to have a place to go, even if it's a monthly group. And the Safe Coalition has done that. And what's great about it is the woman that's running it is a trauma specialist and she works with children. So um, she can, you know, safely run this meeting and make sure they're in a safe space and are able to op openly talk and, and, and in a safe manner. And their parents aren't there listening. It's just a place for them to go. And as a sibling, when I was a kid, I would have loved to have had that kind of support. I used to hide what I was going through. I didn't want anyone to know. And and it's not like they have to shout it from the rooftops, but I just felt like I had to just hide everything. I shouldn't talk about it. I shouldn't ask for help. And those days are changing and they need to change because when you're hiding things and you're internalizing things and, and you feel different from everybody, you carry that with you up into your adulthood and it affects your relationships and maybe even your own parenting. So um, we did open our Family Resource Center. Um, it, it's amazing. Peter Babineau, who you'll see in our video when you watch it, does an amazing job. He works there with Magda, who runs our Spanish groups, and then also Kathy Alamo, who 
um, is somebody that lost one child and has another one that has experienced SUD. So she helps with the still learning, still coping group. And it's amazing. Um, we have yoga there. We've had rock painting. We, we've had um, just different things for people to do. So they're not just focusing totally on what they're going through. Um, coffee hour, you know, just anything that we can do to promote more self-care. There's hiking groups um, where they'll go out and, and hike and then have like a nice fire with hot chocolate afterwards. And it, it's just things people can do together with other like-minded people. And it promotes a healing that is hard to describe. Um, we were entered into the National Archives recently. Um, aside from running Learn to Cope in, in our statewide organization, um, I had been one of the testifiers at the Purdue Pharma sentencing back in 2007. And back in those days, um, we only had like 500 members in when I testified, I said, you know, I'm representing 500 families in Massachusetts. Um, and obviously that number has grown and grown and continues to grow. Um, but today I'm very grateful to our former Attorney General, Maura Healy, um, who sued Purdue Pharma and also the Sackler family um, for mismarketing the drug, because I feel like that's what happened to my son and so many others um, with the with this piece of substance use disorder. Um, it's I find it very sad that back in the 70s and the early 80s when we had the crack ep epidemics and, and what we went through in my family as a young kid, no one really paid attention to that stuff. It really took, unfortunately, it took this epidemic um, for people to really start paying attention to substance use disorder. Um, so hopefully our next generation and the generation after that won't have to go through what so many other generations have, have gone through. And speaking of generations, this is, has been affecting generations for years and years and years. And um, I just find it really enlightening that there's so much more education now today and so many more people talking about it because I really think that will be the key to make the changes. And then the video that you'll watch, um, we just launched that last year, and that gets a lot of. Um, it's very special when you see when you see it. You'll know what I mean. It's really a great video. It highlights exactly who people are that attend meetings. So why do people come to learn to cope, or any meeting like us? It's crisis response. People need help immediately. Um, it's it's a chronic. Um, you know, they're in a chronic situation. They're feeling fear and panic. And what they need is resources. Like I mentioned earlier, when I went to a meeting and I finally got up the courage to raise my hand and say, my son is using heroin. I need help. I need resources. I was told that I shouldn't be doing that, that I needed to take care of myself. That's true for later. But when you have somebody that's overdosing in your house or could overdose in your house and they're a baby, 18, 19 years old, of course you want resources. If they had diabetes and they were drinking soda and eating a bunch of chocolate chip cookies and not on insulin or taking care of themselves, would you say, let them hit rock bottom and you know there's nothing you can do, throw them out. That's what I was told to do. So education about substance use disorder and overdose prevention is key. Any family member that lives with this is a first responder. So they're also looking to find the answer. We're never going to have the answer for anyone. We're not never going to be able to say why this happened. We're never going to be able to tell somebody if that person will find recovery or not. We're just there to help them cope and survive. And part of that survival is having that tribe that I talked about. So there's hope. We always tell people you are not alone. Um, it's a room full of people. It's neighbors, colleagues, um, various economic, cultural backgrounds from different areas. It's Zoom has made it possible for us to, to reach areas that were never able to get to meetings before or 
they didn't feel comfortable walking into a room. Um, so it actually helped us with diversity because people didn't have that uncomfortable feeling. You know, it's just, you go on Zoom, you don't have to have your camera on if you don't want people to see that you're there until you feel comfortable. Then you see that camera come on and people realize that there's no judgment in this room. We're all just here for the same reason. <clears throat> so how does chronic substance use affect families and loved ones? I've talked about this trauma exposure, secondary, vicarious, and personal exposure. The secondary trauma is real. So as mentioned earlier, I do have a team. Um, there's 15 of us around the state of Massachusetts. I make sure that our team gets plenty of help with secondary trauma. One thing that we did notice with Zoom, which I never predicted, was when we were in meetings in, in a room, we were all together and we would hear about something that happened last week. Now when we're on Zoom, we're in people's homes in real time. And we've had some um, instances where there was a knock, there was one uh, recently where there was a knock on the door and someone got the news that her son had been found deceased. So we had to have a protocol um, for secondary trauma. So what we did is we set up a special meeting for everyone that was at that meeting. And I, I hired a trauma specialist to come and talk to everybody so that they could process this and, and you know, go through this together. And um, everybody agreed in the end that this is what we live. This is what our lives are like. And we're not, at least we're not going through it alone. And they, they were glad that they were there for that person. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we take care of the helpers that are helping the people because then we go home with that and we need to really take care of ourselves um, because it can bring up things of our own, you know, what we're going through in our own home. Um, so financial burden, um, PTSD, health and safety concerns, and, and stigma. Stigma hurts and it can be carried throughout a lifetime if it's not addressed. So we believe the antidote for the destructive effects of substance use is connection, the tribe. And the connection we seek is compassion and understanding. Because as I said, um, stigma hurts. It hurts children, it hurts parents, it hurts the entire family. And that is learn to cope. So. I think I need to hit stop share. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, wonderful, Joanne. Thank you so much. That is, you were such a powerful speaker. You know, I think you not only have an incredible story, but it's not just the story of your family histories and personal experiences, but the story that you've made it into by turning it into this incredible network. Thank of you. hope and kind of the impact that you're having around the country and now even outside the country and other countries um, is just, you know, and, and I, I, I think too, one of the things that I love about you and learn to cope in the organization is you can see even from the chat, the kind of powerful <laughs> vulnerability that, that you inspire in others and kind of the, the power and the vulnerability of families um, and individuals affected by substance use disorder in themselves and others. And um, yeah, so Thank just you. so grateful to you. The chat is going going wild. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. I'm reading all your messages. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, so we did have a few questions. Um, so, one of the questions was around the Native, the Native American, Native Indigenous communities. So is that, um, is that a population? I know you guys have the Spanish version now and whatnot, mm -hmm. but is that a population you all have, have worked with or worked for? So I'm very excited. You mentioned that we're opening a resource center in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and that's right near the Wampanoag tribe. So my hope is to connect with the tribe and 
they have their own government and their own um, different resources there. And I really, really, that's my next goal is to, to the Wampanoag tribe in Massachusetts and um, hopefully work together and collaborate with them because that's, like I said, that connection, um, it, it shouldn't matter where we're from, if, you know, when we have a loved one that needs help and, and we love that person, that's all that really matters. So that's my next goal um, with our Falmouth Center, because I'll be positioned right near Mashpee, um, where they have the Wampanoag tribe. So I'm glad you brought that up, because it's something I really want to do. Yep. And, and our meetings are open to everybody. <laughs> I mean, people, anyone can come to our meetings. So, but I really would love to connect with, with the Native Americans, for sure. Wonderful. And I guess I'm really dropping your email address in the chat because I think we've got more comments than I can count um, of individuals that would love to connect um, on on various fronts afterwards. Um, one of the other questions, um, just because National Council members, um, a, a good portion are behavioral health care providers. So everything from peer specialists to therapists or you know, and it even gets to, to doctors and psychiatrists um, and individuals working at health centers across the United States. And, you know, from your perspective, from the family's perspective, how do you think we can better treat and serve not only the individuals, but the families as well in healthcare settings? In medical healthcare or behavioral or both? I'll leave it, I'll, I'll leave it open, um, you know, but kind of from your perspective, like where should we start or what are things that you're hearing from families? Mm -hmm. One of the things that really jumps out to me is, um, you know, pediatricians, a lot of times that's a real opportunity for, for them to talk to parents about, you know, their, their children if they're experiencing drinking alcohol or um, depression, things like that. And then on the behavioral health side, um, bringing the family in, so they're really bringing the family in and having family therapy for the, the family as a whole would be wonderful. Not every family would take advantage of that, but also um, children that have lost parents, there doesn't seem to be a lot of services out there for them. My niece who passed away left behind a son who um, our family has raised and he just got accepted to college. I'm so <laughs> proud of him, but he's gone for a long time um, trying to find somewhere to really talk and talk through the death of his mom. And telehealth seems to be really working for him. So I think telehealth is, a wonderful thing. And I think for kids, um, because they're so savvy with um, technology and social media and everything, I think telehealth is a good place for kids to get therapy um, that are either experiencing substance use or have lost somebody or just going through things with the family. So, um, and it, if it's affecting one person in the family, it's affecting the entire family. So I guess finding ways to implement um, people to reach out to other family members maybe, or to bring to family members together in a setting, I think those things would be very helpful because we see a lot of sometimes two parents are not on the same page. So having like um, really good addiction specialist that specialize in marriage that's going through um, either a spouse that's um, experiencing substance use disorder or a couple that has a child that's experiencing it because we see this all the time. They'll, they'll come to the meetings together, but one thinks one way and the other thinks the other way and they're not coming together. Um, eventually they do once they find their tribe um, we've seen that happen, but I think if there was more specialized therapy for, for parents that are dealing with this, I think that would be a huge help out there. That's Does that really make sense? Insightful. 
completely. Yeah. Um, one of the other questions was from Michael. And um, so he's coming from a rural area and um, a rural coalition that is concerned with youth substance use and kind of wanted to pick your brain about what are some potential strategies um, you think to find folks that might need help in the community. I know we've talked about stigma and you know, that's still very real and folks not wanting their communities to know about their family's personal struggles and things like that. And so I don't know if you have any ideas on like, how can we better identify, work with, you know, bring in the perspectives and, of families? How mm -hmm. do we find them? So one of the strategies we've used um, We've, we've had public forums over the years where, you know, we want to talk to communities about teen um, alcohol and drug use, and, and you'll be lucky if four people show up. <laughs> but when you have something else and, it, and you combine it with that, like we had a doctor coming and talking about concussions and how to treat concussions or... Um, you know, and it was for like the athletes' parents. So the athletes' parents would come to learn about the co concussions, but he was an emergency room doctor that dealt with that a lot. But then he'd say, and by the way, <laughs> and he'd, you know, um, teach the the parents about addiction and what he's seeing in the emergency rooms that, you know, smoking marijuana and alcohol and, you know, it, and teach them that way. It, Sometimes you have to be savvy when you're planning community events on how can you get people out there. Um, and sadly, when you do a community event just on substance use disorder, you won't get a large crowd because people don't want to be seen there because they think, they literally think, well, someone's going to see me here and think that I'm going through this and, and they're worried about the stigma. So if you... I think schools should have mandatory events for parents. Like maybe if their kids want to go to the prom, the parents have to attend this this night or the kids have to attend this night and, you know, just talk to them, have experts there um, and not scare tactics, just more the brain and science. Um, there's a doctor in Massachusetts. Her name's Dr. Ruth Potee. Um, you can find her on YouTube. She has the most amazing presentation on the science and the brain and addiction that all kids should see because it, it doesn't just tell people don't use drugs. It says this is what scientifically will happen to your body when you use these drugs. And it's much different than that old frying pan. This is your brain and this is your brain on drugs from the 70s that never worked. This is more science. Um, we teach kids about, you know, early age about nicotine and not smoking. Why are we not teaching science? And I mean, second grade, they don't have to say, don't use marijuana or don't use alcohol. They should teach them more about their brain when they're very, very young. Um, yeah. I'm probably going all over the place. No, you know what? And I was able to very quickly find Ruth Protee's video. So I did drop it in the chat. Um, so, yeah, I think what you said makes complete sense and it's really resonating, um, but the strength and the vulnerability to share your story and then everybody here today in the substance use interest group, thank you so much for your strength and vulnerability as well. Um, Aaron just dropped it in the chat, but we will be sharing the recording. Um, mm -hmm. And the PowerPoint slides afterwards, I did drop Joanne's email in the chat as well, so you can reach out to her afterwards. But I hope that everybody has a really wonderful, let's see, today is Wednesday. <laughs> and um, we look forward to seeing you at the next interest group webinar. But thank you so much. And huge, huge thank you to Joanne. Thank you, everybody. I wish I could see all your messages, but <laughs> the support is so nice. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. This was nice. It was our pleasure. Thank you again. See you Thank all. You. Bye. Bye.